Shalom. Shalom. Good. One more. Shalom, 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 shalom. I, I just can't. I, 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 I totally can't. I totally can't. Totally can't. Shalom, shalom to you. Shalom to you this day. This is our word, you guys. This is the word for this year. Shalom. Shalom in 2020. Shalom does not just mean a ceasefire from war. Shalom means justice, flourishing. Beauty, equity, health, all things working together, coordinating, functioning according to God's perfect plan and purpose. Look at all this. Look at all these trees and all, all this grass. In the first service, it was pouring rain. I'm sorry you don't get to experience that in this service. Um, we were singing in the rain. The rain was falling. It was watering everything. See all this growth, all this beauty, all this stuff? That's called shalom. The world isn't really operating like nature right now. There's a lot of um, not shalom <laughs> right now in, in, in the world. And that's what we're going to be talking about week after week, building in a belief system for ambassadors of shalom, believing that we as the body of Christ are about to begin the mission of Christ which is that his kingdom would come, his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Realizing, recognizing that the opposite of shalom is what? Chaos, good. Fear, good, good, good. Strife, good. What else? Confusion, absolutely. Worry, absolutely. Chaos. Anxiety, sickness, you guys are, you guys are, oh, you guys are so smart. Like, yeah, the, the opposite of all of these things are injustice. That the opposite of shalom is, yes, chaos, fear, anxiety, all this stuff, but it's injustice. So biblically speaking, whose job is it to execute justice on the earth? Just go ahead and put your hand up. Us. It is the sadiq. It is the righteous that execute the righteous ju uh, justice of God on the earth. And this is what we're going to be talking about, you guys. Over the next however, we're going to be talking about Shalom 2020. The role of the righteous to begin gardening. But before we dive into it, I uh, just want to congratulate Timmy, uh, who graduated uh, high school at Hazen High School. Do you wave it? Congratulations, buddy. We're proud of you, man. That's a huge accomplishment, man. 12 years, all right? Who else? You also graduate high school? Come on, stand and wave everyone. Congratulations. Good. Who else? Who else do we have? Anyone else graduate high school or college? Anyone else? I know um, Cooper, Cern he's not here, but he graduated college. Also Jordan, Jordan and, and Amanda, they both graduate, right? Um, I, I forgot to say something last week to Jordan, but girls, girls smart. I saw online what her degree is in. I was like, Wow, girl, smart, smart like her parents, awesome. So, I want to congratulate all of our all of our students. All right, if you guys got your Bibles, let's go. Jeremiah chapter twenty-eight. And if you're watching online, God bless you. Shalom to you this morning. Shalom to you. Jeremiah chapter twenty-eight. We have we have three responses right now to what's happening in, in the culture. These are not new responses, and um, the the chaos right now is very thick. It's very intense, but chaos is not new to the earth. It's not new to humanity, and the common responses are not new as well. It's very important that we work on our beliefs. Why? Because our beliefs will determine our behaviors. In the world, we always want to address behaviors. Sometimes as parents, <laughs> we always want to address behaviors. But if you address behaviors without addressing beliefs, it's like taking a weed eater and cutting off weeds. What happens? They grow back. You can cut something down, but it will grow back. 
Why? Because there's a root system that has to be addressed. Your beliefs are the roots. It's what's happening underneath the soil. Therefore, right now, we can't just punish people into, <laughs> into proper belief system. We can't just attack people and think that that's going to fix. We've got, we've got fundamental issues and injustice that are taking place within the soil. And that means that we need to be a people of the soil. A soil people. Not very sexy, but all right, you know, <laughs> dirty hands and all this, right? Um, three responses right now. The first response is we can escape. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Escapism. A belief system of escapism. Okay. The second response is we can attack. So you can escape and have an escape worldview. Don't worry. It's going to get darker and darker and darker. And then we're going to get off this hell rock and Jesus is going to incinerate everything. <laughs> okay. Good, good, some good escapism theology. Or there's attack, which is, which is basically like, I don't know what to do. I don't have a clue what to do. I'm triggered out of my mind, so I'm just going to start attacking everything. I'm not going to wait for Jesus to incinerate. I'm going to incinerate. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, but not today. That, that won't really be today's kind of thing. And then the, the third response is, oh, here comes the rain. Shalom. It's the way it ought to be. All right. The third response is we can garden. How many of you have ever been to Bouchard Gardens? Yeah. Bouchard Gardens. It's, 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 right it's right next to Victoria. It's in um, British Columbia. When, growing up, we used to take our boat, and we used to put our boat in the little cove there. And it's so peaceful. We used to wake up and go up into the garden. It's the most beautiful garden you've ever seen. You've got these gorgeous man-made waterfalls. You've got, like, flowers and fragrances. And I'm telling you, it's overwhelming beauty. I mean, maybe, maybe you've never been there, but have you ever been somewhere where the beauty was overwhelming? overwhelming. It was like human ingenuity and creativity crafting this place of nature. It's like where nature becomes art. You know what I'm talking about? And like when you're in it and you're in the middle of it, you're just like, wow, this is, this is gorgeous. This is beauty. And then all of a sudden, like you're looking at a rose and then like a, a butterfly just comes and lands on the rose and just looking at you. It's just like, what's that? Yeah, this is a perfect moment. You know, like these perfect moments where it's like, like th 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 this incredible collaboration. Like, like this is this place of of shalom. It's this place of, it's this place of flourishing. It's these these moments. But but when you look at when you look at the earth right now and you see places that aren't being stewarded, how many of you have ever been in a neighborhood and it's like there was no gardening in that neighborhood? It's almost like people were just surviving there, but it's like there was no real plan for it. That's the thing is when you go into a garden, you see that, there, that somebody had a design. Somebody had a plan. And they put that plan on paper. And then they began to recruit people. And they began to say, here's the vision. I've written the vision down. I want you to read it. I want you to see it. I want you to help me create it. That in the beginning was the plan. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was beauty. In the beginning was righteousness, peace, and joy. In the beginning was the garden. And in the garden, God put man. I shared this last week in the third service. I felt like it came from like a revelatory flow. I, I wasn't part of the notes. But on the real estate maps, this area is called Eden. That behind you is May Creek Park. That's a green belt that they can't build on. When they put these homes in right next to us, they called the new homes Eden Grove. That here you have a garden, Eden. And in Eden, God planted a church called Seattle Revival Center. That there would be a people who aren't trying to escape that there would be a people who aren't attacking, but there would be a people in the garden who would take up the Edenic mandate that God spoke to Adam and Eve and said, 
work the ground. Work the soil. This is going to take a long time, but I want you to expand Eden. I want you to expand this place of convergence. This place where God would come down and walk with man, where, where God would walk and talk. That for Seattle Revival Center, that, that if we're going to take on this great Edenic mandate, that his kingdom would come, his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, we have to realize there's no silver bullet for restoration. That this thing is not going to happen tomorrow. That it's going to take a company of dreamers, a company of, of gardeners, a people that are willing to say, this is going to take some time. This is going to take some work. This is going to take getting messy. I want you to declare this with me. I'm not trying to get out. I'm trying to get in. This is what we're going to be looking at today. Because there are some people that are going to tell you it's icky out there. It's dirty out there. It's sinful out there. It's demonic out there. It's perverted out there. So let's stay here. Let's only stay with our holy friends. Let's only meet in our, in our righteous communities. But don't go out there. It's secular out there. It's pagan out there. It's homosexual out there. It's Democrat out, I don't, I, out, out, out there. There are all these terms and all of these things. What do we do? As a people of God, do we stay separate? Do we stay holy, knowing that it's just a matter of time till we all get raptured off of this thing? He's going to bring out his incinerator and completely destroy all of the earth so that he can start over because his plan was a big failure? Or do we believe that when Jesus said, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that he did not say that to tease us. He said that to invite us because he knew that death was not our savior and the rapture was not the great hope of the church, but that Jesus Christ is the hope of glory. And that if there are people that say, I'm not trying to get off this thing, I'm trying to get into this thing. If there are people that are willing to make a long-term commitment to say, this problem is my problem. Good thing I'm a gardener. Good thing there's a plan. Good thing I know that destruction is not our strategy. There's a strategy happening in the world right now. The strategy is destruction will bring forth restoration. But our strategy is this. Redemption is the only vehicle to restoration. That what people need isn't to be punished. What people need to see is a God who was punished on behalf of evil mankind. That he who knew no sin became all of our sin so that we could become the righteousness of Christ Jesus. It might seem cliche, but there is no weakness in his kindness. And love is the answer. And love is a man. Love is Christ Jesus. And this Christ Jesus is in you. Christ Jesus, the hope of glory. I'm not trying to get off of this thing. I'm trying to get into this thing. I'm not trying to punish people and attack people. I am trying to love people. And there's a battle for your belief this morning. There was a battle for your beliefs last week. Why? You get the wrong beliefs, you have the wrong behavior. We can't afford to have a short-term mindset. We can't afford to have a mindset of separating and building our own little holy ghettos. Why? You might stay clean, but the world will stay dark. Nothing new, under, Solomon would say, there's nothing new under the sun. And I would tell you this morning, there is nothing new under the sun. The battle wages on. How will the church respond? History will be written according to how the church responds. Jeremiah chapter 28, let me set this up for you real quick. In Jeremiah chapter 28, the people of God had been kidnapped and removed from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was like the private school for the sheltered kids. 
Jerusalem was the place where there was no drugs, sex, or rock and roll. It's like the people of God were sheltered, clean, taken care of. And now the private school kids had been removed out of their shelteredness. And now they've been kidnapped by the evil, demonic, compromised, perverted Babylonians. They had set up a little camp, a little ghetto right outside of Babylon, right outside of Babylon. This is such a, this is such a terrifying moment. Everybody knew that Jerusalem was the center of God's redemptive plan and purpose. And everybody knew that Babylon was the antichrist. That Babylon was where the, the most wicked, vile practices were considered normal. And the most wicked things imaginable were celebrated within the culture. And now these private school kids, these sheltered kids, never been exposed to anything. Now they're right outside of the darkest, most evil, vile place. Put yourself there for a second. You're, you put yourself with your own children. You want to keep your children safe. You want to keep your, and you've been kidnapped. And you know that they want to bring you and your family into Babylon to assimilate you so that you'll become just like them. That's the context for this, for, for what we're about to read. They're outside. All of a sudden, a prophet named Hananiah speaks up. He's got a word. Here's the word. Jeremiah 28, verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. Um, he gives forth this word. In two years, we will be liberated. He does a prophetic drama. He makes this big wooden yoke. He puts it around his neck, and he breaks it off. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty good word. That's a pretty good prophetic word. Here's the prophet. Thus saith the Lord ha, that our enemy ha, will not keep us down. It will not keep us here. We're going back to Jerusalem. Ha, come on now. Ha, I said we're going back. Ha, and he gets so excited, he breaks off the yoke. He, ha. Let's see how Jeremiah responds. In verse 6, and the prophet Jeremiah stands up and says, Amen. May the Lord do so. And may the Lord make the words that you have prophesied come true and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord. It's this, it's this prophecy of Hananiah says, we're going to stay out here. We're going to stay separate. We're going to stay together. Because in two years, we're going to go back to our home. Jeremiah says, Amen. Now let's see what happens. Turn the page. God speaks to Jeremiah. In verse 13, he says, Go tell Hananiah, thus says the Lord, You have broken wooden bars, but you have made in their place bars of iron. He says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put upon the neck of all these nations an iron yoke, to serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and they shall serve him, for I have given to him the beasts of the field. Go down to Jeremiah 29, verse 4. Jeremiah gets up and addresses all the people. We got this prophetic word. It's one thing. Now, Jeremiah, this is like the clash of the prophets. Good thing that there's no clash of the prophets these days. Amen? Okay. Jeremiah 29. Verse 4, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Did you hear that? God says, Thus saith the Lord, the one who has ordained this. Verse 5, he doesn't say, Just stay in your little tent, stay separate. He says, go in and build houses. And do what? Live in them. <laughs> Plant gardens. 
eat their produce, take wives, have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons, and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there. And do not decrease, but seek the welfare that is shalom. Seek the shalom of the what? Of the city. Of the evil city? Seek the shalom of all of that ugliness and that... Seek the shalom of the Antichrist city? Look at what God says. Why? Because that's where I have sent you. Declare this with me. I'm not trying to get out. I'm trying to get in. He says, go in. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you. And pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For in its shalom you will find your shalom. He says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. Why? It's a lie. They are prophesying to you in my name, but I didn't send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when the 70 years are complete for Babylon, I will visit you. I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your shalom. Plans for your welfare and not for evil. But plans to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me. You will pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. And when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Hananiah says this, two years, don't get comfortable. Stay here, stay separate. Stay holy. We're going back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the center of God's redemptive plan and purpose. Jeremiah says, something's shifted. Something has changed. In a sense, it's like the center of God's redemptive plan and purpose has moved from Jerusalem into Babylon. This is what Jeremiah says. Go into the city and seek the shalom of the city. And in doing so, you will find shalom. Shalom. Build houses, live in them. Plant gardens, go in. Love, learn, serve. And in doing so, you will subvert the dominant darkness that has ruled over that region. And fear not, because in time, and it will require a lot of time, but if you've got the time to think long term, I will restore stinking everything, says the Lord. Here is the challenge. If you've got a short-term mindset, Thinking that, that this earth is just a mistake, that all of this injustice, this is just part of end times darkness, that all of this is, is just going to get more and more chaotic and chaotic and chaotic. So bunker down, disappear, stay outside of Babylon. You are going to rob the earth of the blessing that you are. Why? Because God created you to be light in the darkness. But the enemy wants to deceive the church to keep light only in light places. So here's the challenge in this time. We stay separate and we escape. Number two, we attack. Why would we attack? Because we've got no plan. Why would you react? Because you've got no plan. How do I know that I'm around a planner? Because they don't do a lot of talking. Why? They got a plan. When you look at Jesus, he didn't do a lot of talking. There was all this accusation. What did he do? He stayed silent. Why? He wasn't worried. Why? All of this persecution was according to the plan. Jesus was a victim of injustice, yet he never became a victim. Why? He knew it was all part of the plan. I've got a plan. And Jesus knew this. This plan is a long-term plan. And if you're going to be a part of what God wants to do on the earth, you're going to have to start thinking long term. We've got to stop thinking according to election cycles. We've got to stop thinking like four-year Christians. Oh, just another four years and maybe eight years. We've got to stop thinking that way. We've got to start thinking about the next 100 years. We've got to start thinking about, hey, we're going to be here a little while. So what? We're going to have children. They're going to have children. We're going to train our children up in the way that they should go. And we're going to tell our children, the earth will be better because of you. That we've got a certain amount of racism in the soil. 
but don't worry. Why? We're here and we're working in the soil. This is what I know. That what God wants to do will not be solved on Facebook if we are being triggered out and partnering with the spirits that we're attacking. That this is what I know. That what God wants to do, it's going to require community. It's going to require justice. It's going to require a people who are on mission. And it's going to require a long-term theology for restoration. And this is what we're about at Seattle Revival Center. That we would be a people of community. um, Counter-cultural community. That we love each other because we do. That I love you because Jesus loves you. And I see that you were created for 2020. Carol, you wouldn't have worked in 1906. You wouldn't have worked. The earth didn't need you then. The earth needs you now. Declare this with me. I was born for such a time as this. I'm not trying to get out. I'm trying to get in. When I look at the culture... When I look at the government, when I look at the institution of the family, when I look at media, when I look at entertainment, when I look at um, uh, uh, the medical spheres, when I look at the sciences, when I see all of these things, I see false prophets in the church trying to instigate fear to get us to use our words to make a judgment that will rob us of our influence in that sphere. Not going to do it. Just declare, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to make a judgment against the sciences. Why? That's where we need light. I'm not going to make a judgment against the media. Why? That's where we need light. I'm not going to make a judgment against the government. Why? That's where we need light. And when you make an unrighteous judgment, you rob the sphere of your light in that sphere. This is what fear comes to do. Fear comes to get you to come into agreement with an ungodly belief so that you'll use your creative breath to make a destructive creative act that will rob us fear or will rob the earth of light, life, flourishing, and shalom. Did you know that you have the ability to rob people, places, and things of shalom? You also have the ability to create atmospheres of shalom where peace can abide and restoration can flourish. I have decided, I decided this last week, I am not going to be an evangelist of anxiety. I'm going to be an ambassador of reconciliation. I have decided this last week, I'm not going to allow speculation and conspiracy into my heart. Why? It'll rob me of the bandwidth that I need to be an oracle of hope on the earth. This is what I know. That fear, it costs me my courage and the courage that I need to be a creative. The courage that I need to garden. None of us can afford to fall into any sort of fear. Uh, But Pastor Darren, don't you know, everything's being set up for the Antichrist. I couldn't give two poops about the Antichrist. Why? I know Christ. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Pastor Darren, don't you know about the mark of the beast? I don't know about that. I know that the government of his righteousness has been written on my heart. I'm not looking to get out of here. I'm looking to get into here. Why? I've got a job to do. I am not content with where the world is at. And that this is what I know. That for those who will enter into his rest, such a generation will receive the keys of the kingdom. There's a battle for your rest. Because here's the thing, that when we fall out of rest, we fall, we fall into self-righteous striving. What is self-righteous striving? It's where we start doing all kinds of silly things in the natural, in the moment. What is it? It's reacting. Anytime you do something with no theology for restoration, you are reacting to a situation. Why? Because there's turmoil in your heart. We've got to stop doing things when there's ripples on the water. I'll say it again. We've got to stop doing things when there's ripples on the water, when there's turmoil in our soul. I said, I'll tell you a quick story, and i got to get you out of here because I've gone over. When all this stuff was first happening, I got a text message. The text message is, go fill up all your cars with gasoline. Go stock up on food. Because Governor Inslee is about to bring in the National Guard. He's going to bring it in from the south. Because martial law is about to be put into place. There's going to be no more gasoline. There's going to be no more food. What did I do? I went and filled up all our cars with gasoline. 
I went and bought food and supplies. And then I told some people on our staff. And with each person that I told, I saw a spirit of fear come on them. A spirit of fear. Look, it's good to be prepared. It's good to have some toilet paper, right? Come on. <laughs> I love me some toilet. I don't want to have to get creative in, the, in that department. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> why, why are you cutting construction paper? Don't worry about it, right? It's good to be prepared. But I'll tell you what happened. I became an evangelist of anxiety instead of an oracle of hope. Here's how I, I began to re react when there were ripples on the water. And this is what I know. We're going to be here for a while. We're going to be on the earth for a while. And I'm not going to tell my kids, don't worry, baby. Everything's nasty out there, but we're going to stay out of there. We're going to, we're going to just be nice and clean in here. I want to train up my kids to go into the darkness to bring light. I want to train my kids to go into the injustice to bring justice. Why? It's the, it's the role of the Sadiq to bring forth justice. It's the role of the righteous to bring forth justice. And if we are not doing our job, there will not be shalom on the earth. The spirit of worldliness is not smoking cigarettes, is not getting drunk on booze. The spirit of worldliness is not going and playing bingo. The spirit of worldliness is partnering with the spirit of anxiety, chaos, fear, destruction. That is the spirit of worldliness. And it is so important in this time that we're able to bring all of these concerns, all of these burdens before the Lord that we would give them to him and let him trade them out for the ingredients that we need to see his kingdom come. A lot of stuff out there is really, really bad. But guess what? Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Where, hold on, where do we need people right now? Where do we need believers right now? At the Stinking Gates Foundation. Where do we need believers right now? In downtown Seattle, where do we need believers right now? We need believers where there are no believers right now. We need the kingdom of God. In the, but it, we, we need to have people say, don't you know where you are? Don't you know who you're working with? Why? Because when I read Daniel, when I read the book of Nehemiah, when I read about Joseph, when I read about these cultural shapers, they all worked for pagan kings. And what did they do? They loved. They served. They worked the soil. You can serve any king as long as you remember who, who the true king is. You can, you can serve other lords as long as you remember who the Lord of lords is. We cannot afford to entangle with fear. We have to begin to engage with the spirit of righteousness peace, and joy. I'm telling you, it sounds like cliche, but there's no, there's no weakness in his kindness. And what the world needs right now is love, sweet love. And that love is a person. It is our Lord Jesus Christ. You can escape. You can attack. Or you can get your hands dirty. And I'm training my children to get their hands dirty. I tell my kids, this earth will be better because of you. And I'm telling Seattle Revival Center, this earth will be better because of you. This is what I know. Everyone's freaking out. But our God, Yahweh, is not freaking out. I believe that in this time, this is the most important time for Seattle Revival Center. And this service is the most important service we've ever had as a church. Why? Because our beliefs are getting recentered. Our hearts are getting recentered. A lot of lines are getting drawn in the sand. And this is what I know. For Darren, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Jew. I'm not a Gentile. I am not black. I am not white. I am an ambassador of reconciliation, part of the largest family on the face of the earth. And all that stuff that's happening out there. It's happening out there. Why? Because of a loss of shalom. And that's on us. But I am not discouraged. Why? I've got a plan. I've got a plan. Therefore, I don't have to react. Why? Because when everyone else is reacting, we're working. We've got a plan. Good? The kingdom 
is in need of you. Religion will tell you that God doesn't need you. You're replaceable. But this is what I know. You're an image bearer of the Lord Most High God. And that every person has been created in his image and likeness to glorify God. And that means every person out there in the streets. People are, people are reacting. Why? Because of a lack of revelation. There's a lack of revelation because of a lack of revealing. There's a lot of light that hasn't gone into the darkness. It's time. It's time to garden. It's time to engage. It's time to get messy. This thing's going to be so messy. That's how you know you're part of a legit kingdom thing. It's really messy. Messy conversations, hurt feelings. You know that it's real. Guys, it's about to get real. It's, and don't we need that? Because come on, the church has been way too fake for way too long. It's time for people to get real. Yep, let's stand up. I pray that I have offended you in some sort of way. I pray that I have challenged you in some sort of way. Why? Because I do not... I did not sign up for this thing to make people like me. I signed up for this thing because I know that he's got a way bigger dream for this earth than what we're actually walking in. Yeah? I have been wonderfully offended this last week. I praise the Lord. Why? I got to grow up a little bit this last week. And Darren, he needs a lot of growing up. Just put out your hands in receiving posture. I believe the spirit of his grace is going to come right now. He's going to empower you and equip you with everything you need to execute his perfect justice for this week. Just receive by faith right now his grace. His grace. His grace. It's sufficient. Receive his kindness. His perspective. His Father's heart. We let go of all anxiety. We declare we will not be evangelists of anxiety. We will be evangelists of hope. We will be evangelists and heralds of hope. Ambassadors of light and reconciliation. Declare this with me. I am no longer afraid of the dark. His glory has shifted. It has moved. It's, he's hovering over Babylon. He's saying, go into Babylon. Seek the shalom. Seek the welfare. And in doing so, you will find your shalom. We declare we are not afraid of the dark. This is not the end. This is the beginning. He has called us for such a time as this. Gardeners to expand Eden, to expand his peace. Declare with me now, I'm not trying to get out. I'm trying to get in. In Jesus' name, all the people of God said, let's give him a shout of praise to Jesus this morning. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you.